Thanks, Pamela, and thanks to Cassie. Uh, and thank you all for attending this morning. I'm John Little, and the man to my left is Des Rogers. He's my boss. So um, I have to make sure I do a good job out here today. But first of all, I'd like to just pay my respects to the traditional owners of this country, both past and present. And Des will nod when I say this. I think we bring greetings from our people in Central Australia to the Aboriginal people of this area. So, oh, these leaves, I think I took to too many, so I'd better put that down for a minute. But um, I'd just like to give a bit of an overview of uh, what Congress does. Um, and this beautiful young woman here came to us, most probably, it would be close to 30 years ago, Pam, as a fresh-faced um, student and said, we'd be willing to work with Congress on a research project. And at that stage in the early 70s, Congress was developing as a, first as a political organisation, because at that time in the Northern Territory, Aboriginal people were just being, the words I used, released from uh, missions and settlements, released in quotation marks, where um, people were confined, again in quotation marks, by the system, by mission superintendents and uh, welfare superintendents. During that period was a time when, uh, not long after the assimilation period, no, during the assimilation period, but also uh, Aboriginal people were being recognised as citizens. So it wasn't long after that that um, people were being freed from their shackles. Um, at that time there was a lot of energy from most of our tribal elders. They wanted to see ac good activity happen, they wanted to see good services being produced and um, to get simple things like um, health, education and the basic rights to be provided to people. So um, I think I was in the wrong place at the right time. So. It's from then I've been involved in Congress up until today. I've, I'm on my third sentence, I tell people. <laughs> I've been there, this is my third time that I've been there, so I've had a rest in between. But um, Congress is a very dynamic organisation, we're very large, uh, but it's taken a long time to get to where we are from uh, 1973. So um, I think there's my touch on it on a, in a moment. But, um, we're quite a large organisation. We're basically a primary healthcare uh, service. But it, as I said, we've developed from a political organisation where we uh, fought for simple things like people actually going out and exercising, and it's ironic on a day like this, exercising their right to vote. Um, up until um, the early 70s, it was very difficult for Aboriginal people to go out and exercise their right to vote, even though by law at that time, in the early 70s, it was allowed. So that was due to the influences mainly of um, some of our gatekeepers, and they were some people who ran cattle stations, who decided who and where people could live, and also some mission superintendents. So uh, people were constrained, but now, I'm sure all our people out there today are lining up and being harassed by all the people handing out how to vote cards. So I'm not sure if they think it's a good thing, but <laughs> like the rest of us. <laughs> but we have to be able to exercise our vote and um, tell the government what we think of them. But in the Northern Territory, the population of the Aboriginal people is reasonably high. We're about a quarter of the population. And around Alice Springs, we'd be maybe 50%. So Alice Springs is a regional centre for three states, uh, northern, well basically northern South Australia, some parts of western Queensland and um, eastern western Australia. So um, Alice is sort of like the major town in those three areas. So we get lots and lots of uh, people who come and visit from remote communities. We also um, get lots of international tourists and Alice Springs was and is a regional centre for tourism. But 
we see lots of Aboriginal people who are not employed in most of those industries. And I think um, most of the Aboriginal people in Alice Springs, anyway, that are employed work for Aboriginal organisations like Congress. We've got uh, quite a large number of staff, over 300. So um, we're a big organisation and um, we've got a bit of um, political power, I suppose, through our buying power. But uh, most of our people live in poverty. They're mostly unemployed and very poorly educated. So we're hoping from a, a program like this, and if you look at the name down here, Kurinamara, we saw a bit of that happening just a while ago with the two cousins healing our spirit. So um, it's, a, it's an important occasion for Congress where we can work on a program like this. It's, um, it came about because of, most of you would have heard about the high levels of violence and other things that occur in Alice Springs and um, I hate to use this example but it's one that most of you in the room will know about is uh, Liam Jarrah and his fall from prominence if you like. Um, that's a perfect example of what might happen to someone who tries to succeed and cannot cope with the struggles in his family and in his community. Um, we've got to admire him, he's a fantastic footballer and uh, he's got a lot to offer but there's too many pressures that um, are associated with being someone who rises above. Um, yeah, from those things that, um, while we're talking on football, I'm a Carlton supporter and this is what got me into this anti-violence trick. Uh, about five or six years ago, there was an exhibition game in Alice Springs, West Coast and Carlton came to town. And I thought, I'll never see him down in Melbourne because Melbourne's in another land from Alice Springs. It takes ages for us to get here and I had to fly. Um, so my partner and myself went along and we sat in, at that stage, uh, the football ground was, uh, there was a alcohol free area and an area where you could have a few drinks. So I'm a committed non-drinker and I said to my partner, let's go to the non-drinking area. We won't get humbug. Humbug is a word that happens to most of us mob up there. Humbug means we're getting hassled by our families or people we don't even know for things. So anyway, the, the game is going well. Carlton is doing okay. I said to my partner, West Coast is cheating because they're getting a few kicks. The umpires are favouring them. Then we hear this commotion to my left. And I look around and there's an Aboriginal man with his wife and two little kids, maybe four or five year old. So after a while he starts to lay a few punches on it. And most of the crowd, it's almost like this crowd here, they're reasonably senior in age and a few families also. So we all look away and hope that it stops, but it continues and it gets worse. And I don't want to tell you how old I am, but I was the youngest person within range of this guy. So I said, I have to be seen as doing something. So I went up to him and said, stop that brother. And he said, this is my wife, I can do anything I like to. I said, no, you can't. We stood toe to toe for about five minutes without a word being said. And I thought, he's going to lay one on me in a minute. And I thought, shall I hit him first? Because if he hits me, I'll be on the floor. Must be never to get up. But we glared at each other. And I out glared him. And he sat down and was quiet for the rest of the night. And it was from that time I decided to start a program called Stop the Violence. And I wanted men and Aboriginal people in Alice Springs and the rest of the population to just to say those words, stop. And not to be scared or to be sensible about it. We just have to do it. If you use your sense, you must be thinking, oh, I could be killed or injured or 
something else. So it's from that we decided to run specific stop the violence uh, programs where we tried to get everyone to understand that it's not your, your given right to assault anybody, especially the ones that you love the most and possibly kill them. So, um, as I said earlier, Alice Springs has got a reputation for being pretty violent. And we just wanted people to understand that, you know, violence is not normal. It's not acceptable. But, what my nose. Sorry. Um, excuse me. Um, so from then we had a number of marches. We had a uh, media campaign. We conscripted a lot of schools, uh, government departments to um, be part of the process also. And we tried to get the concept across that um, violence is a bad thing and you know there's other ways. We can be respectful and loving of each other. So um, we've done a number of uh, health summits for men and at that stage it wasn't long after the Northern Turkey intervention had been brought in. And what I've said before is that um, would that process Aboriginal men were basically demonised by that. We want to try and make men um, return to their rightful place of being leaders of their families, being role models, being good fathers, <coughs> uncles, grandfathers and that sort of stuff. So um, we tried to re-educate our men on how to behave, how to be respectful, how to be good fathers, good uncles, good role models in the communities and to be possible leaders. Because one sad fact is that most of the Aboriginal men in the Northern Territory, at some stage, end up in jail. And you can't lead your family from jail. Um, the jail population in Alice Springs is uh, about 90% Aboriginal. And then mainly men, Aboriginal men. So just imagine taking 600 men out of one community that weakens the role, weakens their, their functioning power because they're all incarcerated. When they're in jail, they're fantastic guys. They're meek, they're mild, they're respectful. Let them out, it's totally the opposite. So we, we've been trying to find ways to make our men understand and be good men, and they've got a positive role to play. Thanks for that, folks. But um, Des is telling me that give me the last five minutes. I think we're pretty close to that. But um, we're, we're hoping that through this project that we can find ways for all of us to work together and live together and try and understand and how to heal our spirit down here. Kurunamata. So we've all got spirits. It doesn't matter where we live or who we are. And some of us need our spirits healed. And on that, I'll hand over to Des Rogers. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Um, yeah, my name's Des Rogers. Um, I'm a Southern Arana man. I was born in Alice Springs. Been around a bit longer than John. Um, and I'm very lucky to recently be appointed the Deputy CEO of Congress. As John touched on, Congress has been around for 40 years. Uh, we do a whole bunch of different programs. We've got three, over 350 staff, half of those are Aboriginal. Uh, we've got a budget of around $38 million, so we're a big organisation, as uh, John said. Um, we're very fortunate to have people like John, who's worked extremely hard over a number of years, uh, was heavily involved in the 2008 summit, 2010 summit, and we just recently had another summit in 2013. But we've all decided that uh, Talking is not really getting us anywhere. We've done a lot of talk, so uh, now it's time for action. And that was the theme of the last uh, summit that we had out at Ross River, um, east of Alice Springs. So next week, where uh, Cassie people and um, a number of people are coming up to Alice Springs, and we've organised a Q&A session Tuesday night, next Tuesday night. NITV are coming to film it. Uh, we're also filming it as well. Um, and we're going out to a... Uh, Mission Santa Teresa on the Wednesday, and we're having another function on the Thursday. Just like to point out behind me is the poster uh, called Walking My Shoes. And as you can see, one's a sand shoe and the other one's a thong that you wear in your foot. 
Um, and that's something that, uh, a theme and a name that I came up with. And the story behind that, which I'll tell next Tuesday night, is I was out at a community a couple of years ago talking to somebody and uh, there was a young local Aboriginal lady there behind the counter and she got up and said, oh, I'm just going to go for lunch. And as she was walking out, I noticed she only had one thong on. And uh, I said to her, how come you only got one thong? And she said, oh, I don't know, my sister must have the other one or something. And I said, isn't it uncomfortable having one thong? And she said, oh, well, one thong's better than none. And I think that sort of says it all in a nutshell about us blackfellas, particularly from remote Australia, that we just get by. Uh, with whatever. So next week, the Q&A session, um, we've got uh, Jenny Brockman, who's a Supreme Court judge in the Northern Territory. We've got the Mayor of Alice Springs, Damien Ryan. We've got uh, the Northern Territory Chamber of Commerce President, Julie Ross. And we've got a couple of these um, professors as well, experts, international experts, which is fantastic. And one of the soapboxes I've been on, particularly over the last few years, and I've been on a lot of soapboxes, is about Aboriginal men perpetrating Aboriginal violence against Aboriginal women. Uh, the statistics are going up, they're actually skyrocketing, skyrocketing, whatever that word is, that things are going up in the air. You only have to sit at the ED or the Alice Springs Hospital, or only have to sit in the mall in Alice Springs and have a look at the Aboriginal women, both young and old, that are walking up and down, and you see them battered, scarred, and in some cases um, handicapped from violence. Um, I see the ads on TV in Alice Springs about non-Indigenous women that suffer uh, certainly the same sort of uh, treatment by their uh, husbands or partners. See them bundling up, bundling up the kids, getting in a taxi, going to another suburb, maybe going to another town or maybe even going to another state. Um, people don't, under, don't realise that in remote Australia, Aboriginal women have got nowhere to go. Because of uh, culture, kinship and customary law, family obligation, Women have got nowhere to go. So there's only one thing that happens, they end up dead. And that's the harsh realities. Or they work, walk out into the desert and they end up dead. So we've got to do something about it. Um, and that's, we're very fortunate, very privileged to have Cassie contributing a significant amount of money to this project. So next week we're going to change and we're going to look after our women. And I should say that not all men are bad men. Not all Aboriginal men on communities are bad men. We don't want to demonise Aboriginal people in remote Australia, but we've got to stand up and face the facts, and we've got to do something to protect our women and children, particularly our female uh, women and children. Um, so we believe that we'll see significant change over the next uh, few years. We're fortunate at Congress that we auspice five communities around Alice Springs. Uh, Amungana, Santa Teresa, Mutajulu, Uchu, or Arianga, um, Ndari, or Hermansburg. And uh, we prepared a submission last year to what's called the Aboriginal Benefits Association uh, for what I refer to as a health promotional vehicle. Uh, Johnny owes me $50 because I got the $250,000 uh, from that submission, uh, which was approved by the previous, um, or the current, I should say, or maybe previous, in a few hours, <laughs> Federal Indigenous Affairs Minister. And this is a concept drawing of the truck um, we're still $140,000 short, so we're going to raise that extra money. And uh, lo and behold, we've got a box here, so you know, stick all. You don't want to take $100 notes, so stick them in. Um, and one of the things we're thinking of doing, if you can see up there, one of our programs is Headspace. Um, so we thought, or I thought, that we'd uh, try and sell some of those logos, sell some of that space on the vehicles. So the back of the vehicle with the Headspace there, you know, it'll only cost you $50,000. Fantastic. Opportunity only knocks once. Have a mobile billboard in remote Australia. What a, what a fantastic way to promote your organisation. So 50,000, if you want the big one on the back, then on the side you can see uh, 25,000 or 15,000. Now I don't expect all that sort of money to flow today, but if you want to give a pledge, by all means, get a spot on the truck. Um, so, uh, because Johnny took up all the time, um, I've gone over time. So I'm going to pass this red box around. Don't feel obliged to put any money in. Don't put any IOUs in there. Um, and I'll watch you when you go out the door. So thanks very much. <laughs>